Katya, thank you very much for uh, the introduction. And uh, uh, thank, um, thank all of you for um, uh, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned, I have a kind of a mixed background. I have um, a uh, career uh, as a finance professor at the Yale School of Management, but I have a background in uh, archaeology and the arts. And uh, this book, uh, which took me about 25 years uh, to write, is an attempt to bring those two worlds together. And so you'll see in this presentation, it's mostly visual, um, but um, I've also been mindful of the fact that although it's fascinating to dive into ancient history, it's also important to see what that tells us about today. And so um, I've chosen a subtitle for my talk, which is 4,000 Years of FinTech. And you'll see what uh, I mean by that uh, shortly. The proposition in the book is a very simple one, but it's important uh, <clears throat> to uh, spell out, which is that uh, finance is not a way of life. Uh, finance is not an ethical framework. Finance is a tool. Finance is a technology, a set of tools. And um, just, like, um, uh, just like some mechanical, uh, uh, just like physics or the application of physical principles, uh, finance is uh, neither good nor bad. It's just a way of getting things done. Now, what distinguishes finance as a technology? There's one thing, uh, which is uh, the dimension of time. Uh, finance is a technology for moving value backwards and forwards through time. And uh, so you can think of a loan as the simplest form of, of financial operation. Um, and of course, when you move value backwards and forwards through time, you have to deal with this, the veil of uncertainty and the risk that's associated with the future. So if you think about the two big picture issues in, in, in finance. One is the uh, dealing, with an dealing with future cash flows or, or, uh, and moving them uh, to the present, that dimension of time. The other one is, is, is the risks associated with that and how we insure against them and how we, how we take those risks. Okay, so I promised uh, to bring this up to current issues. One of the things I get asked about all the time, and I'm sure all of you get asked about this, and I'm sure some of you are experts in this room, is the new technology of blockchain. And um, when I think of blockchain and, and what it is good for, I think about some of these, uh, these features that, um, uh, that have been proposed. Uh, it is a distributed ledger system that uh, once a transaction has been entered into this uh, ledger, it's irreversible um, and it's mutually verifiable um, and, 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 it, and it has a permanence to it um, that, that uh, is anticipated uh, so that you, 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 can't, uh, you, can, you can settle disputes in the future. Um, it's, it's quantitative, so you can put the numbers in there and, and spell out quantities. Um, and uh, it can be used mutually, used as a record uh, for both sides. Uh, plus it's cheaper, so lawyers are, are kind of worried about uh, disintermediation of their task. Um, here is the, what I would uh, pose as the origins of blockchain technology. Um, you may not know what this is. It looks like a toy. Some of you probably do. It's called a bula, and uh, it uh, is about 5,000 years old. And it's a clay ball that was used in ancient uh, Mesopotamian cities. Um, and inside the ball are those uh, little things that look like toys, um, these little round things. So um, how did it work? Uh, the... Uh, Two parties would contract for delivery of some future good. In this case, uh, this might be delivery of, uh, of five sheep. Um, and uh, they would put those sheep into this clay ball. And then they would put their signatures by rolling a, uh, a little uh, signature um, uh, stone all over the ball so that, the, so that um, it covered the ball. Now... Why did, they do, why did they roll it to cover the ball? They rolled it so that nobody could break in, poke a hole in there, and take out one of the, the stones. 
So that was a technology that protected against uh, the uh, corruption of the contract. Um, and <clears throat> um, well, uh, why did they have these five little pieces like this? The bullet were used before the invention of writing. Um, and uh, this was a financial contract that, that preceded the ability to actually write one down. Um, now, uh, is this permanent? Well, it's lasted for 5,000 years. So that's a lot longer than any blockchain is ever going to last in our society. So this was a great invention. Maybe never, uh, and, uh, ex apart from carving it in stone, this is one of the greatest uh, permanent records of a quantitative uh, co contract. Now, that bullet system evolved into this system, which is a written record. And writing, e writing was developed in order, to, um, uh, in order to record financial contracts or business contracts. I call anything that has a dimension of a promise today and a delivery tomorrow uh, finance. So um, here is an interest rate. Uh, uh, here's, a, here's a loan from about 1600 BC. And um, those little marks on the outside of the ball um, became cuneiform writing impressed into a, a, a tablet. It became really uh, kind of a pain to have to um, put things inside the ball. So they would, they would make marks on the outside saying five sheep. And those marks on the outside became the written language. The word for sheep came from a little symbol for sheep. And five, you had to poke little, five little holes, but then they figured out a nice system for, for, um, for making bigger and bigger numbers. So if anybody asks you why finance is important, well, it led to the invention of the written, of written language. Um, by the way, it also was essential when, when uh, that wasn't just a contract between two people, more than likely it was a contract for delivery of goods to a central temple. Um, the, as cities grew, you had to have a way of planning for getting food to people and a, a way a process of taxation. So um, the growth of cities was facilitated by the ability to make these longer term contracts and also plans, uh, 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 planning accordingly over, um, over years. And so um, it was uh, the first thing that finance made possible was, was a larger urban um, um, made cities, uh, gave them the ability to grow larger. I'll show you one more of these tablets before we move on because this is my favorite. This is a, this is a tablet that's about the size of a pineapple and uh, it's in the uh, Yale Library. And <clears throat> it's in Sumerian. Um, you, the way you could tell that is that the marks are in these little um, uh, um, boxes and it's the first record of compound interest. So if anybody uh, uh, you know, asks where does compound interest come from, this thing uh, dates to 2600 to 2400 uh, BC. And the compound interest part, I can actually show you something about it. Um, it was a dispute between two city-states uh, in, uh, in now in Iraq. And if you zoom in on Google Earth, they both uh, they, they look like desert. Um, and one state uh, conquered the other state, but in doing so, it forced it to pay reparations. It said, look, you've had our land for 80 years, um, and we want you to give it back, but also pay interest on the, uh, for those 80 years. Interest rate for that payment was 33 and a third percent per year. Okay, that's even higher than I pay on my credit card, which is limited at 29.9%. So compound a credit card debt for 80 years, you know it's gonna be huge. So um, to, to, to deal with these issues, the Mesopotamians had to invent ways of making very, very large numbers. So you can see uh, on this where the numbers are. See this right down here, these three holes. That number has to represent something that um, now we would regard, we'd measure um, in the billions. Um, and the way that it worked was, first you'd stick a little, you'd turn over your stick, and it was, had a round bot uh, bottom like, a, like, a, um, uh, like an eraser. You'd stick that in, and that represented 60, because it was base 60. And then you'd have a larger stick, 
and put on top of that, it would be 60 uh, 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 squared, and you could use powers of 60 um, successively to represent larger and larger numbers. So this was a quite an ingenious, uh, I would call it software, the, the development of mathematics to express very large numbers, an imaginary number actually, because nobody was ever gonna pay back what amounts to about a, a, a trillion bushels of grain. Um, but it was financed, it used in the kind of service of a, a, a political dispute. So um, uh, this is just a fascinating document that, that shows you how finance, financial thinking was integrated into the notion of, uh, of society, politics, uh, and the state. Okay, today now also we're excited about new payment systems. Um, we don't use uh, cash very much anymore. Um, the younger you are, the more likely that you are to be using a social media app like Venmo to pay, even though your friends can see what you're buying. It seems to be kind of uh, what people do. Um, and then um, we also have uh, uh, interesting challenges to large-scale payment systems now, um, uh, Bitcoin being uh, uh, one of them. So... <clears throat> um, the payment system in Mesopotamia was all an accounting system. They didn't have coins. So all of those records I was showing you, they may have used silver as a, as a unit of account, but by and large, everybody w w had some account or ledger that they were running with, uh, with each other. Um, and, and part of that was because um, you know, it, was, it, was, it was a city-based organizational uh, structure where you kind of knew who was coming in and out of your city and how long they would be there. Um, but you want your payment system to be convenient, um, secure, accepted, and you don't want uh, there to be the possibility of inflation. So I put limited there. Uh, that's why Bitcoin has this feature of only so many Bitcoins being made and then everybody keeps losing them, so that even makes them more valuable. Um, the really innovative payment system uh, of the uh, 7th century, borderline 6th century uh, uh, BC was coinage. So we always think, well, the invention of money must be coins. Money was invented before coins. Coins just became a very convenient way when there was a bunch of, when there was trade in the, in the Mediterranean. You didn't know whether the person, you could run an account with a sailor who might have come from, uh, from Athens uh, three, uh, year, three months ago. Um, you would use these coins. You know, you'd ch you'd, the people would uh, get coins when they entered your port. They used the coins um, to buy things, and then uh, you didn't care whether you ever saw them again. So um, uh, Athens itself had the for good fortune of being located right near one of the, the, most, the largest silver mines in the Mediterranean. A lot of the Athenian uh, wealth came from that access to silver that then became the coin of the, uh, the, the a, a widespread uh, unit of currency. So that, uh, so much so that the Athenians um, um, uh, were in the good position of saying, well, um, we can make goods come to our, we can get grain shipped to us and all we give them back are these little pieces of silver and then they trade amongst themselves with this. <clears throat> There's a lot more going on uh, in the book about uh, ancient Athens and the relationship to the development of democracy. I get very excited about it, but, but, but the payment system alone made it uh, really an innovative um, feature. So here's another document. Uh, it, uh, the book also looks at the Chinese side of things, uh, the financial innovations in China and how that related to the Chinese state. But China invented paper money. Uh, this is a document that dates to the Ming Dynasty, early Ming Dynasty. So for those of you that read Chinese, this is a, a Da Ming. And it says, the great Ming universally circulating treasury note. And this is the sign for money. And this is a, an amazing technology. Um, the, in order to print the money in China, and, and it, the printing began about 1100 AD, um, they had to invent a process that, um, that the bills, you could print thousands and thousands of bills and have them all look exactly alike. They invented a copper plate engraving. Uh, 
Uh, so the woodblock engraving wasn't good enough. They had to have a copper plate in order to print these things. And then they put, you can see as a technology to prevent counterfeiting, they filled it full of all of these decorative uh, borders um, in order to make it something that people would recognize that people that were illiterate that couldn't read, they had to put a picture of how many strings of coins that you, this was good for. Um, and then they had an anti-counterfeiting feature built right into this thing. Uh, quite, uh, quite innovative. Um, this message is a long message. It basically said, <clears throat> anybody caught counterfeiting will be killed. Anybody who, who turns in a counterfeiter will get a reward. So, um, so the doc, it's a contract right there that is uh, sort of self-reinforcing. Okay, so um, these new payment systems, um, that's just two examples of them. Um, I wanna move on to another broad domain of financial innovation. Um, and I'm gonna call that loosely speaking trading platforms because um, uh, one of the things I study is private equity. And uh, private equity has gone from being very illiquid to being progressively more liquid as you have private e shares in private equity ventures, limited partnership shares. That, uh, that exchanges have been created. Intermediation has made it possible to actually uh, uh, sell these things. And this we think of as a very a positive um, uh, development uh, for, for investors. Um, and then we hear about new trading platforms um, on the internet uh, for all sorts of things um, and new ways to access investors and so forth. So I'm gonna show you um, that, um, you know, there are a few principles that you need. Transparency, you need act, active share uh, trading, so liquidity. Um, you need to make it uh, accessible to a broad uh, pool of, uh, of, of those people that hold the shares. And uh, there's a desire for a fairness, because if you think somebody else knows more than you, or somebody else has an advantage, you're not gonna trade with them, and so the market will break down. And so those are the features that, um, from the very beginning of financial markets, uh, were necessary. Uh, this is a bond that we have in the collection at the Yale School of Management. And it, it, it's a tradable security. And so um, this security was originally developed, uh, it was issued um, <clears throat> in 1648. And it was issued in Holland, near Utrecht, and um, it was issued to finance, it was, a, it was an infrastructure bond to, to finance a very small um, curve in the, uh, uh, the river Lek. It's called uh, Lekdijk Bavendams is the name of the place. And so um, they uh, sold off these bonds, they fixed up this uh, piece of uh, property, and the bonds are perpetual bonds. So this is a living financial instrument. Um, every, every decade or so, uh, somebody from Yale has to fly over to, uh, to uh, Utrecht and then uh, present uh, something and say, okay, pay me the dividends, uh, the coupon on this loan. And uh, it, it, we only do it every 10 years or so because um, that's about what it takes to pay the airfare. That's how much we get it. <laughs> um, but what's amazing about this is in Europe, uh, bonds were invented uh, and the tradability makes them an extraordinary instrument for savings. Um, you, you know, if you don't have bonds, what, what other instrument do you have for, for, what other perpetual instrument do you have? You have uh, property, you know, you have agriculture, you know, you have fields where you can grow, grow grain, but this was a, a, a substitute for that, a financial substitute for physical property. Um, along with the creation of bonds, um, and actually so the earliest bonds that were created were sovereign bonds, actually bonds that were issued by uh, Venice, um, uh, the Republic, uh, Venetian Republic. Um, in order to make these things, um, they got more and more valuable when people realized that um, not only could they pass the, they tr give them to their children and so forth, but that you could, you could tr trade them. And the first uh, bond exchange, the first bond market, 
is the, in the Rialto Square in Venice. So that's, that's what we're looking at here. Um, and this was, uh, it, it's the heart of one of the, uh, Europe's earliest um, financial centers. So not only did you, it, could you um, uh, exchange, trade your bonds, you could also get loans there. There were bankers there. There were insurance brokers there. Um, so um, everybody, you know, it's exciting to go to Venice and go to Piazza di San Marco and look at this beautiful architecture. But if you think of the really uh, the, the heart of what made Venice great, there were three parts. There's the Arsenale where they could build those fantastic boats. But before they built the boats, they had to have the money to build them. And this is where uh, the, 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 the money was being generated. So I think of this as a must-see uh, for Venice um, that, um, that, that few people recognize is a, land, a watershed in the history of finance. Okay, um, I've gotten very interested in crowdfunding. I think, um, I think it's got the potential to democratize access to ventures in a way that we don't have now. So venture capital now, I think, has been uh, captured by a set of institutions um, private equity partnerships and so forth, and yet uh, and, and much of the large gains to, uh, let's say, to, um, to Apple and, 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 and Facebook and, and so forth, uh, went to, to, um, to, these, to a few institutions that uh, were investing in venture capital. Now we have the, the ability uh, to have websites where you and I uh, could go and, and, and invest, you know, two or three thousand dollars, and then participate po possibly in the next big Facebook. Um, I think this is a fantastic thing, but it threatens existing institutional structures. Um, and it, because of that, ever since the beginning of sort of a crowdfunding approach, there has been a resistance to this, uh, uh, to, to op democratizing access to uh, innovation and, and, and growth. Um, well, I mentioned this. I, I, I see it as <clears throat> bringing in new investors, allowing new enterprises to develop, uh, creating a new model for governance, collective capital, and, and, and that involves distributing uh, the control of these uh, ventures. One of the big innovations uh, in financial history is the creation of, uh, of, uh, of the corporation, and with it, um, permanent capital. Uh, that can be traded on an exchange. I showed you a bond exchange before. This is a picture of a Dutch, uh, a Dutch East India's, Indies company uh, boat. And the crowdfunding uh, feature of it was the sale of, broad sale of shares um, uh, amongst, not, uh, amongst uh, many Dutch investors. What they made possible was um, also a sharing in the risks associated with that. So uh, when we think of um, equity uh, uh, corporations that, that, um, that emerged uh, during the uh, late 1600s and, and early 1700s, they were oftentimes connected to international trade. Uh, and and uh, so a way of capitalizing ventures that required uh, quite a bit of an investment to create to build boats and so forth, but uh, as well, boats that might not come back. Um, I'm gonna show you another side, which I think is also, I think I would argue is equally socially beneficial to uh, international, as opposed to international trade, which is equity funding of, of, a, of an early corporation in Toulouse in, uh, in, uh, in the 13th century. So, and this is just part of my personal research. Um, here is from the Nuremberg Chronicles, which has great pictures of, uh, of cities. Here is Toulouse and uh, La Vie Rose. And over on the left-hand side, it, it, what looks like a bridge is actually a mill uh, that water would flow through and it would turn big millstones. This was um, the earliest recorded uh, uh, corporate organization. It had limited liability, it had a board structure, it had a rotating board structure, uh, it had external accounting, um, it had one shareholder, one vote, as opposed to one share, one vote. Many different features of it argue that it was um, an early corporation. I told you that some of my personal research is about this, 
Um, the feature that I've spent some time on is collecting the prices, and I do this with um, two, um, uh, two other economists uh, who, uh, in Toulouse. They've spent the time collecting the data, so I'm taking credit for it today. Um, but collecting the prices and the dividends for this company, that um, it, it goes back another couple of hundred years, but we have excellent data from about 1,500 or, or so. And there are two lines here. One line is the, um, is the price level of the shares, and so that's all the way over here, 6,000 livres tournois, which is quite a sum of money. They weren't cheap shares. And then the dividends on this side. So here's a picture with a rolling average where you can see that um, the, over the long term, prices and dividends for this company move together in quite a rational uh, uh, way. As the dividends go up, the prices go up. Um, and to make a long story short, you might want to know what the long-term rate of return on this oldest living company is. It, it, it lived up until um, the French nationalized it in 1946. The rate of return was uh, about 5% real return per year. Um, now, that's a company that survived a whole lot. Uh, but, but nevertheless, <clears throat> um, it's kind of nice to know what the, what the expectation was and what the realization was through that time. These shares were actively traded as well, and eventually the company got listed on the Paris Bourse. Um, although it was nationalized, the French also have recently spun off part of their electrical company, which is what now is hydroelectricity, uh, is the raison d'etre for this uh, firm. And so now you could go back and buy a little bit of this ancient firm if you wanted. Okay, um, I'm gonna wind up with some areas of data analytics. Big data, that's also something I think a lot about. Um, I use uh, text analytical tools and, uh, and things like that to, uh, to explore um, in my research. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so um, there are historical precedents for all of these. Um, one of the most interesting is the, um, one of the things that really made a difference in uh, the, um, in the business uh, of the Middle Ages was the introduction of Arabic numerals and algorithms for calculating net present value. Um, and um, so some of the things I've worked on personally are, uh, these are two pages from um, the mathematician Fibonacci, uh, his book, uh, which was a textbook about business finance, essentially, or, or business operations. And he introduced, or he, did, he wasn't the first one, but he popularized the use of Arabic numerals uh, in, uh, for merchants. And um, this is a, a kind of a handwritten page from one of his books. Um, and he had several banking problems. So, um, you know, we sort of, banking had to go underground after about uh, the middle of the 1200s. Uh, there wasn't a lot written about it explicitly, but uh, before it did, the, Fibonacci was solving very complex problems uh, of interest rates. Um, and uh, so, um, <clears throat> so uh, this book, uh, one of the things that's exciting about it is the, under, the understanding of the present value uh, relation. Another thing that uh, was introduced uh, as a result of financial problems uh, is the correct calculation for uh, life annuities. I will just say there's a long story behind this guy, John DeWitt, um, but, um, but uh, he was the first to realize, to, to actually quantify the difference between writing a, an annuity contract for a five-year-old girl and an 80-year-old man. Uh, and before that, it wasn't clear what the mathematics were because life expectancy was not carefully thought through. Okay, so one last bit. Cambridge Analytica uh, is on all of our minds. One of the things it exploits, exploited, is people's willingness to jump in and tell, tell, uh, tell the world about itself, uh, answer questions, um, this sort of strange enthusiasm for the internet. 
Um, and um, I, I also work in behavioral finance. And so I think you can't separate finance from human behavior. You know, all sorts of mathematical analysis involved, but bottom line, there are people making decisions. Now, here's a print of the, uh, <clears throat> the first big uh, famous financial uh, bubble, uh, which is tulip mania. And in this picture, you see the same thing you just saw, saw in the previous picture. Here's a, a hat with no head, okay? Here is a little scheme of a brain separated from the body. Uh, now, what do you see here? A hat with no head. Um, and uh, the uh, a whole narrative that he, about how foolish the speculators in the tulip bubble were. Um, this notion that the brain can go haywire and uh, and do things that are not good for the, the the good for the markets and good for humanity is is built in from the earliest critiques of financial markets. Um, <clears throat> Um, the most famous uh, 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 case uh, that is, is uh, anyway, another case that I've studied is the case of John Law, um, the speculator, uh, the gambler, uh, the visionary uh, financier who, who built this company of the Mississippi in France in the uh, early 1700s, and this became the first incredible bubble in stocks. And the reason that he was, okay, there are many reasons that people posit, but I think the reason why he was so successful at getting people to buy stocks in a company that essentially was created to exploit the Mississippi West in, uh, in America um, is because he understood this, this, this drive uh, uh, for transforming your personal uh, wealth. The idea that you could buy something and all of a sudden be as rich as the people who you're watching their carriages go by and democratizing that, uh, I think, is very powerful, and that has hooked people in to, 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 to uh, investing. So here's a picture of John Law. He's up here. This is uh, the Rue Quincampoix, which now is right behind, in Paris, the Centre Pompidou. <clears throat> but the important part are all of the people. Uh, pictures of this, fear, uh, this excited, one, wild crowd trying to trade all of these shares. <clears throat> That bubble, um, that Mississippi bubble is represented here in a, in a, uh, a recent thing from The Economist, or, or Bloomberg actually. It shows you how high that bubble is um, compared to the dot-com bubble and compared to tulip mania. And here's Bitcoin. So are we in a historic period? Maybe so. Uh, but, so, I can't resist a little bit more about the future. <clears throat> You take in this whole sweep. My main theme uh, has been finance as a technology that deals with the same old problems, right? Um, the themes the recognized today are the themes that were solved in different ways in the past. Uh, but I think that um, the things that have to be addressed in the future are this relationship between finance, the mind, the emotion, where there can be a breakdown in rationality. Um, we argue about whether we should um, be patr uh, paternalistic and not let people invest their own money or just let them do whatever they want and then live with the consequences. Um, that's, an, that's a very live and important uh, debate. Uh, I think finance is going to be used f important for the next level of infrastructure, that is the global level of infrastructure. If we need to solve problems about uh, the environment that require a global uh, technological solution, that's a whole one or two levels of uh, uh, a, a magnitude beyond what we currently have the capability for financing, but I think it may be something that we should prepare for. And, and finally, the uh, age-old problem of people outliving their, uh, their means of uh, economic support. Um, so uh, that again is something that, um, particularly in the United States with our state pension systems failing so badly, um, finance is got to solve and novel uh, propositions uh, are things that we're going to have to consider. So I'll leave it with those big issues. Um, thank you very much for your attention and, and uh, happy to um, hear uh, your thoughts.